Welcome to Sex Ed with DB. I'm your host, DB. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the podcast. If you love and support the work that we do, consider joining my crew on Patreon to win amazing prizes like our adorable merch, exclusive behind the scenes content, and incredible sex toys. Go to patreon.com slash sexedwithdb to join my crew. Get discounts at all of your favorite sex toy shops at sexedwithdb.com. And follow us on Insta at sexedwithdbpodcast and on TikTok at sexedwithdb. If you want to partner with us, email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com. Looking for a new and exciting lube to add to playtime? XN's water-based lubes are FDA cleared, GMO free, and made with vegan ingredients. Made by people with vulvas for people with vulvas, their pH balanced lube is silky smooth and provides long lasting lubrication for enhanced intimate comfort and enjoyment. Plus, they're toy compatible. Try their non-flavored lubes, aqua and aloe vera, or their flavored lubes, raspberry and their newest apple teeny. Get 25% off with code sexedwithdb at xns-usa.com. If you've been a longtime fan of Sex Ed with DB, you've definitely heard of Clona Willy. But if you're new here, let me fill you in. Clona Willy makes incredible DIY molding kits that allow anyone to make an exact replica of any penis or vulva into a high quality, 100% body safe sex toy. And there are so many fun colors to choose from. Use promo code SEXEDWITHDB for 20% off at clonawilly.com. And follow them on Instagram at clonawillykit. We talk a lot about sex ed, but when we're shopping for products to support our sexual wellness, exploration, and expression, we head to the experts at Lion's Den. Lion's Den is an adult retailer with 46 locations nationwide and hundreds of your favorite brands. They have everything you need to explore and express your sexual side. Right now, you can use code SEXEDWITHDB for 15% off your purchase in-store and online. Follow them on social media at Lion's Den Adult on IG and TikTok for exclusive offers, deals, and giveaways. Anya and Hannah, hello. Welcome to the podcast. How's it going? Hello. So excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Of course. As I as I mentioned to y'all before the interview, I really just loved your intro email to me and it spoke to me. And I'm so excited to get all into everything that y'all do. We're going to be talking about trauma today and sexual health and mental health. And I'm so excited to delve into it with you both. So thank you for being here on this fine afternoon. Uh, Let's get started by y'all introducing yourselves and really tell us what inspired you to found the Pleasure Collective, your organization. All right. Well, hello, hello. Uh, My name is Anya. She, her pronouns coming to you from Seattle, Washington. Is it rainy where you are right it's now? It's actually sunny, and I didn't oh, put on sunscreen. Uh, oh, boy. Oh, Anya. Gotta go back. I Gotta know. go back. Every That's day, sweet. Anya. I know. It's, it's yeah. essential. Every day. Essential. Come on. I know. I know. <laughs> um, and I'm Hannah. I also use she, her pronouns, and I am coming to you live from Denver, where it is sunny and also it was snowing earlier. It's very confusing. That makes sense. Oh my it's God. very I'm in, yeah. I'm in Brooklyn and it was legit 20 degrees and fierce wind chill yesterday. So here we are <sighs> in spring. Excellent. Love uh, this for okay, us. cool. Um tell tell us about the Pleasure Collective. What is it? What do y'all do? What's the story behind it? And tell us more about your backgrounds. All right. Um well We, so Pleasure Collective was born out of our graduate school research. Anya and I met when we were getting our master's in social work here in Denver. Um, And the way that we met was that I decided we were friends. Um, And And like, I choose you, Pikachu. Yes. I was like, you're my friend. I heard she was looking for a new internship. And I was like, we're looking for a new intern. And I like poached her and like put her resume on my supervisor's desk and was like, pick her because I want to be her friend. Um, and, um, and we've been in love ever since. Um, 
but we started Pleasure Collective. Our graduate school research was all about um, sexual healing modalities for survivors of sexual trauma. So like healing modalities that were going to support survivors and rebuilding their relationships with sex and pleasure. Um, and this all started in 2018. So really there was not a ton of information. Now there's like so much more, it's so much more robust. Um, but we worked to develop a curriculum, um, at our internship and then started hosting workshops locally. And then once the pandemic hit, we, and you know, Anya had moved back to Seattle. We pivoted to a virtual platform. Um, and we, so we host virtual workshops and like maybe hopefully someday again, we will host in real life workshops for, uh, survivors of sexual violence, their loved ones, their partners, their family members, um, to help build tools to rebuild relationships with sex and pleasure. Um, both of us were noticing that there's a lot of conversation about how survivors needed to be fully healed. Uh, you mm -hmm. can't see me because this is a podcast, we're using air quotes, uh, before they can reconnect with their bodies and reconnect with their sexuality. And that felt really dismissive of a really important part of our humanity. And um, we were having a hard time finding people to support us in our own healing. And so we went full, you know, a league of their own. If you build it, they will come. And here we are. <laughs> Amazing. Anya, anything to add to that? Oh, I think she nailed it. Well, then that's it. That's the <laughs> answer. Um, if you were if you were to put like the the mission, I guess, of the Pleasure Collective into like a paragraph or, you know, however long you need, really. But like I just I'm curious about the the end goal of of the Pleasure Collective and how you kind of share that goal with folks who may want to join we like to say that everybody deserves pleasurable sex no matter where they are in their healing journey um and kind of how hannah was saying like uh, a lot of uh, clinicians maybe won't talk about sex um or think it's important until somebody's like quote unquote fully healed um and like what does that even mean first of all and like Second of all, like you, you're going to be waiting a really long time to be having sex and not a lot of people want to do that. Um, and sex can be this wonderful, powering uh, or powerful healing tool for uh, for trauma healing. Um, so let's talk about sex. Let's have the sex. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and really just like making sure that folks know that these are things that regardless of your past experiences regardless of the messages that you've received from the world around you that like these are things that we're allowed to talk about and like I feel like <laughs> the biggest part of our work these days is just saying these words um mm. and making it being really loud about sex and pleasure uh because the world deserves it yeah and yeah. like yeah also totally. like the world's kind of a dumpster fire <laughs> correct yeah and also I I don't know what you're saying also is just making me think about the fact that every sing. I mean when you look at the me too movement right like every single mm -hmm. person I know who is a woman or a non-binary person or a trans person has experienced sexual harassment in one form or another and I just mm -hmm. think that when those experiences are so much a part of every single person's life, there has to be a larger platform in which we can learn and process and unlearn some of these behaviors and some of these things. So Definitely. agreed about like screaming mm -hmm. about it from the rooftops <laughs> and then also talking about pleasure and like using that as healing. I think that's super powerful. Um let's back the truck up. Let's learn about y'all's sex ed growing up because I'm curious about like, what was your path to becoming mental health therapist? Was this something you both knew you always wanted to do? Was this like a direct fuck you to your sex ed? Like, tell me about <laughs> where you grew up and what your, what your path was. Yeah. Uh, so I, 
don't really remember my sex ed experiences in school that much. Um, but I can like vividly recall like every time sex or puberty was talked about and mentioned at home, which were definitely like not positive memories by any means, but were certainly impactful. Um, and, you know, that I, you know, created this narrative that, you know, sex was a hush hush thing. And um, so much so that like, I was was in a relationship and it took me quite a long time to tell my partner that any form of penetration was like incredibly painful um, and took me even like more years to tell any friends or like even doctors um, because it was something that like I I didn't know that I first of all I didn't know that that was not normal and I didn't know that I could like advocate for for my needs um or that like my pleasure mattered um I did like eventually tell my sister it wasn't until grad school um but I did eventually tell her and she encouraged me to like listen to this podcast on sex and it was through listening to that podcast that I really received permission for the first time to talk about sex and to advocate for my needs, which was just like such an empowering, felt so empowering. Um, Sex with Emily. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, And, and so freeing. And then I realized like, Oh, I, I want to give other people this permission to kind of what Hannah was talking about earlier. Um, So I did switch careers a bit not not entirely um luckily I was already in graduate school for social work and mental health so it was a a relatively easy switch of focus to make and which led to me and Hannah interning together um so it all you know all worked out quite well at the time it was um quite the quarter life crisis uh because I had been like dead set dead set on uh, becoming an in-home family therapist since I was like in seventh grade. Um, Mm. I didn't like it. That did not suit me. (laughs) I like this. (laughs) And what's your focus now? Is it specific in sex therapy? So it's kind of like a combination of not having great sex ed or memorable sex ed, sex ed that was impactful, uh, feeling a lot of shame around sex itself. And yeah, also a a fuck you to not talking about sex. And um, now I want to now I want to scream about it. Amazing. And what about you, Hannah? Um, I was, so I'm lucky enough that I grew up in Northern California. And so where in Northern California? Uh, I'm from Santa Rosa, Sonoma County. Cool. My family lives yeah. in Napa, so okay, very okay. close. My, my dad's a wine guy, so. Oh, cool. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in California, and I grew up, my fa- my parents are both, like, lapsed Catholics, um, and so they, you can tell that the intention was there to, like, break that cycle of, like, trauma and shame around sex, but, like, the delivery was crap. Um, instead of normalizing it and letting it be a topic of conversation, my family was one of those houses where like, if there was like kissing on a movie screen or like things were starting to get like hot and heavy, um, we would all just like stare at each other really awkwardly or like pretend that like, like I would like dissociate and just be like, I do not exist. Do not perceive me. Uh, I am a ghost on this couch. Yeah. Like I am refusing to acknowledge the fact that I'm like watching the fucking hangover with my parents. Like who does that? Um, but anyway, um, sex ed was like pretty, meh my most vivid memory of sex ed was seventh grade um shout out to miss crow she was like now like now i realize she was a crucial part of my like queer awakening um but she was this like super butch uh science teacher and she taught us sex ed and she had everybody go around at the beginning of uh the first day and play the penis game and um another guest recently said this that they were like oh yeah they made us say penis five times and i did it like like, you know obviously there was like no mention of vulvas or anything like that which whatever but i was like i'm gonna win the penis game and so people were like getting really excited about it i'm 12 and i stood on a desk and shouted penis to like end the game really Um, so i um 
like cut to 20 years later <laughs> um I but like my relationship with sex was very like fear-based like I just remember my mom saying something to the effect of like nobody's ready to have sex in high school no if you're not prepared to deal with the consequences then you're not prepared to have sex and I was just like mm. okay I guess that means I'm not like ready to do that and so I was very scared um and didn't have a lot of there wasn't a lot of room for curiosity uh it wasn't until like when I was in college I was surrounded I did a lot of work around gender violence prevention bystander intervention kind of stuff I work to develop programming for bystander intervention on our campus and that was when I it kind of clicked that I was like oh a sex is supposed to be fun b like a lot of the experiences that people are describing as like normal are incredibly violent and unsafe Mm. um and then I (laughs) that brought me to the Peace Corps where I taught sex ed in the middle of nowhere Um, what where yeah, I was in a swamp in Paraguay. Uh, wow. Yeah, real adventure. And that brought me to grad school. And I started grad school. I started getting my, my master's in social work, uh, convinced that I was not going to do clinical work. I was like, I'm not going to be a therapist. I'm not going to be a therapist. I'm going to be an educator. I'm going to work on the policy side. I'm going to be on the community development side, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I run a private practice. <laughs> Surprise. Why do you think that, why do you think that changed or like what came to light for you? I, so my favorite thing about social work is the way that like the big picture informs individual relationships. So it's like very contextual. And so I always wanted to kind of marry that micro and the macro of social work. And I tried to do it the other way where I was like, being a clinically informed person in a big picture setting and it just didn't feel right. Mm. Um, and I, I wanted to be a therapist when I was in seventh grade. Like I knew, um, but I had to, you know, just like try on a couple hats before. And now I have my dream job. So. Wow. It's very cool. Okay. That's amazing. Congrats. That's Thanks. not many people can say that. And so the Pleasure Collective is something that y'all are doing on the side, but clearly mm-hmm. a very impactful thing for both of you and for the people that you serve. For sure. Pleasure Collective is our like side hustle passion project that we hope one day we can like turn into a full-time, full-time like mm-hmm. collective um, once I get my butt back to the West Coast. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. So it's like in due time. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm planting the seeds. Love it. Love it. Okay, cool. Thank you for that context. That's super awesome. Um, Let's switch gears and chat about sexual trauma. So as Hannah mentioned, when she was doing her college bystander stuff, realized that violence was so much more prevalent than realized or than people understood or accepted, what have you. And I'm curious if y'all could define what constitutes sexual trauma and share how many people have experienced it. Yeah, so so sexual trauma is a, a big term um, and uh, quite the umbrella term. It encompasses uh, a lot of different experiences, whether that's sexual harassment or sexual assault, you know, sexual exploitation or rape. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, these experiences are not few and far between, like they are happening all the time. Um, and, you know, whether you are aware of it or not, or whether you want to accept it or not, you do know somebody who has experienced some degree of sexual violence. Um, and I, I think that uh, for, a it's been a while since I've looked this up, but um, I think for attempted or completed rape, it's one in six women. And for some sort of like sexual violence involving physical contact, so probably ex- excluding sexual harassment, it's one in three. Um, and you, you also have to take into account like the huge number of survivors that are not coming forward with their stories. 
out of fear or or shame or you know mistrust of the criminal justice system which is totally fair um so those numbers are actually probably going to be a lot higher um and and they're a lot higher once you start to look at more marginalized bodies too absolutely right when right. we're talking about you know trans femmes face an exponentially higher rate of sexual violence than cis women Black trans femmes, exponentially higher on top of that. Um, so it's a big, big systems issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you said that about marginalized people because I, the other night, went to uh, a comedy show that was a podcast recording of Michelle Buteau, her podcast. It's called adult hashtag adulting. I've never heard of it before, but I love her as a comedian. I love so I Michelle went. Buteau, yeah. She's the tits, as they say. Um, and a lock was there. Um, and <gasps> they are that. yeah, they are just a very famous person, first of all. So I was like God, kind of yeah. starstruck at <clears throat> seeing them. And a uh, I think their name is pronounced. A maybe. And I was they if you don't know them you should look them up um they are a poet and a trans person who is an activist and an advocate to protect other trans and queer people and just the amount that they were talking about that they experienced suicide ideality and so much pain from others laughing at them assaulting them harassing them just by way of their identity and their gender expression. Mm -hmm. And that's just such a powerful microcosm of what so many queer and trans people face every single day just by being themselves. And especially with all of the really harmful and violent don't say gay bills and anti-trans youth healthcare bills that are permeating the country now and seemingly always were always will be unless people really actively fight against it which there are advocates and activists who have been working for decades on this but it's it's really disheartening to see all of these things when we know that the statistics are true that queer and trans people are more at risk than cis people and cis people are also mm-hmm. in and have violence enacted against them so yeah just kind of wanted to bring up that anecdote and just say that it's happening every day and it's happening more to queer and trans people so super important and let's kind of sorry sorry i interrupted you oh no i'm just agreeing with you yeah for sure (laughs) sorry the Um, therapist in me like has a really hard time not doing the like yeah totally like absolutely you're so right that's so valid (laughs) i really need that in my heart so thank you that's very nice i just love having therapist friends and therapists in community with me because they're just the most understanding kind people which is really nice um but I'm kind of wondering how how do y'all think that sexual trauma impacts one's sexuality and one's sexual self concept, and when what does that even mean? Like, how is that formed and how is that impacted? Yeah, I I think that that can be hard to conceptualize for a lot of folks because oftentimes like these experiences only last uh, maybe like a few seconds or or a few minutes, like how could they have such a big impact? How could they be so traumatizing? But, but it's true. Like they, they really can be. And on top of like, you know, maybe like your traditional trauma responses, you have like, um, like flashbacks or dissociating hypervigilance, um, survivors, like you were saying, like, can experience responses that directly affect their sexuality or or even like their views on sex. Um, so that can look like uh, maybe like autom- uh, having automatic reactions to sex or, or f- any form of touch that are completely different than what they once were, um, you know, changes in the amount of sex that you want to engage in, you know, for some folks, that's going to be a huge increase. And for others, they don't want anything to do with sex. Um, you can experience like fluctuations in sexual functioning and arousal, you know, maybe there's new sensations you feel like pain or maybe you aren't able to become aroused or orgasm at all um 
you might struggle with, you know, being vulnerable with others, uh, trusting others, having intimate relationships. Um, there are, maybe there's this fear that people always are going to take advantage of you um, or, or invalidate you. Um, a lot of a lot of survivors have a difficult time like trusting their own body, um, being able to listen to their body cues or even like feeling safe in their own body, in their own vessel, which can be like a really scary, unnerving experience. Um, your your thoughts and your narratives around sex and sexuality can can shift too. you know, whether that's thinking that sex is inherently bad or um enjoying sex is bad like experiencing pleasure from it is not okay um or thinking that maybe like your own sexuality is is harmful and disgusting um and because sexual violence has such an impact on one's sexuality and sexual self concept like that's why we love being able to use sex and sexuality as a tool for healing because Mm -hmm. your sexuality is yours and yours alone um and what is more empowering and more healing than being able to reclaim that being able to reclaim your pleasure being able to reclaim something that is inherently yours that was taken from you Close your eyes and think of your ideal sex toy. No matter what you like, you'll find it at Fun Factory. A few things Fun Factory's toys all have in common. They're 100% body safe so your mind is free to focus on fun. They include sex educator design games to get you going. And they're made in Germany, meaning they're long lasting. You get more O's from your toy when it stays in your nightstand and out of the landfill. Follow Fun Factory on IG at Fun Factory USA and use code SEXED with DB for 15% off your new favorite German vibe. In a world that constantly encourages you to change, it's bold to just be yourself. Sexual expression and satisfaction are different for everybody, so rather than conforming to others, focus on falling in love with who you are. Lion's Den sources the very best products to help you find what you like and help you feel confident expressing your sexual desires. You can get 15% off in-store and online using code SEXEDWITHDB to begin exploring everything about yourself. Follow Lion's Den on social, at Lion's Den Adult on Instagram and TikTok. Beautiful, powerful, really good. Two thumbs up. Um, yeah, I just, very nice. I just don't like hear people talk about trauma in that way as much. Of like, sex is sex is yours. Your body is yours, and we can use sex and pleasure as a tool to reclaim your body. And I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, but the first place my head goes to is sex with yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Like if if you're somebody who, and again, I'm not a clinician, I have a master's in public health and I'm a sex educator, but I would assume that this comes up for y'all, which is if one of your triggers is someone else touching your body, then maybe it's just getting comfortable touching your own body again, if that's something that you're having trouble with. And like using sex toys and using maybe like erotic tools like audio or, you know, ethical porn, like things that maybe would stimulate you if you're really not used to that. Is that stuff that you all talk about in your workshops or give us like a little teaser as to how like how what are these activities you know like what is this sexual reclamation and how can therapy and other therapeutic activities help to do that yeah absolutely so one of the portions of our kind of like flagship workshop is a series of relearning touch exercises um and what's what i really love about like the concept of relearning touch is it starts at a plate like the way that Anya kind of built out this part of our curriculum is it's designed to really meet you where you're at. So right now, if like feeling like skin on skin doesn't feel safe for you, like let's start with like wrapping yourself in a blanket and having a barrier between like the skin on your hand and the skin on your arm. Like if that, once that starts to feel good, let's like level it up. Once that starts to feel okay, let's explore like touching ourselves naked once that feels okay, let's explore touching ourselves in a sexual fashion. Like really, I think the, in terms of like relearning touch and rebuilding that comfort, a lot of it is 
giving ourselves permission to slow down, giving ourselves permission to say, okay, I want to do this in a different way than I did before, or I want to make sure that this is different enough um, from my traumatic experiences that I can feel that pleasure. Um, we pull a lot from Emily Nagoski, Come As You Are, um, who is, I want to be here when I grow up. Um, <laughs> she is she is very cool and very yeah. much like, uh, like a famous person in the space. Yeah. I feel like that's easy mm-hmm. for people to be like, I want to be you. You're yeah, perfect. No, when I met her like pre-pandemic and was so starstruck. Um, you seem super I, down to earth. She's super cool. But anyway, um, we talk, we also talk a lot about like building out a context that feels safe for you. Like what are some of the elements that you need to make sure are present in order for you to be in a headspace to access pleasure, right? Like we go all the way back into, does there need to be, can there not be any overhead light? Can there, do we need to have like, is there a certain smell that we need to avoid? Is there certain music that can't be played? Is there certain music that should be played that is going to help you get into that space? So yes, a lot of our workshop content is about building that comfort with, you know, sex with yourself like you said um kind of taking down this idea like masturbation is bad because it's not it's great it's great time highly recommend um and also normalizing the fact that there are a lot of other non-sexual factors at play that we need to be mindful of in order to feel safe accessing pleasure can you give me some examples of those yeah um So, okay, so the overhead light thing, that's my thing. I cannot have overhead light. Can't do it. Um, It's like sensory nightmare for me. Um, And so overhead light, maybe that's a, that maybe that's a deal breaker for you. Um, Maybe, um, maybe a must have for somebody is like, I need to make sure that all of the chores are done. Mm-hmm. Right, like I because they're like have... cycling through them in their yeah. head. Mm-hmm. Maybe a must-have for somebody is I need to be able to see your face when we're engaging mm-hmm. in any kind of like sexual act. Um, maybe an accommodation is I don't want to see your face. Right, whatever it might be, the I think one of our biggest intentions is to give people the space to be curious about what it is that creates a context where they can access pleasure and then to just like embrace those things. Whether Mm -hmm. that's, whether that's clean sheets and no dishes in the sink, whether that's, you know, playing with kink, whether that's whatever it might be. um, We have, but like, I think there's a huge challenge in that a lot of folks don't have the language for that. And so a lot of our work too is also just saying these words out loud and letting them be things that fall out of our mouths without like being afraid to say like, oh yeah, like exploring kink. Like let's talk about impact play. Okay, let's go for it. Um, And so I think a lot of that work too is just like empowering folks to move through the shame that we're taught about talking about sex and having it be something that instead is like a, a fun point of like community and friendship and connection in our lives. Yeah. Two, two things coming off of that. One, I imagine that y'all get very close as a group. If these are workshops where you're sharing and you're being intimate and being open and honest about your wants and desires and traumas and hardships. And two, I think what I'm sure that this workshop offers is, you know, um, the same kind of things that you might get from journaling or therapy, which is, as you said, the language, the tools, Mm -hmm. the context, the ability for self-reflection to understand what you like, what you don't like, why you do or don't like those things and how to move forward with those things. Mm-hmm. Our genius, Anya, actually built our curriculum into kind of like a, a space for self-reflection. So when you go through our workbook for our workshops, there are spaces for everybody to reflect 
Anya has like reflection questions and prompts us really beautifully. Um, so that's absolutely an intention is to just like get people thinking. I did not know what you were about to share. And then you started talking. I was like, oh yeah, I did do that. That's really cool. I am a genius. <laughs> All right. And like one of our like missions and goals is to uh, to have this community of uh, of survivors and like uh, yes, Hannah and I built the curriculum and are facilitating the workshops, but we are certainly not the experts. We are learning uh, right alongside all of the participants, um, and we love that we get to create this space in this community that brings a whole bunch of. Sur- of survivors together and they just get to validate each other and not feel alone and share share ideas. Um, I think for a lot of these things, because we don't talk about them, we don't know what we like, we don't know what we want. And so being able to hear other people sharing their likes and desires, um, you know, might like spark ideas for us. I'm like, ooh, maybe I want to try that. Ooh, that sounds really cool. Ooh, I don't like that either. Um, And so we all just get to learn from each other. And like you said, yeah, we become like really close and it's, um, it's really beautiful to be witness to. That's amazing. It's really dreamy. That's awesome. You're, you're living your, your dreams, which is We always, we always cry together after workshops. (laughs) Oh, that's sad. It's like our closing ritual. (laughs) It's like, all right, we're going to cry a little bit. And then we listen to Lizzo, but then we probably cry some more. Yeah. Yeah. So many things are popping up in my head. Um, The first is just that, like, I'm sure there are going to be some really interesting studies done about sex and intimacy during and immediately after COVID when all of us have our faces and technology more than ever before. And it's a lot harder for people to become present and just like sit and be less anxious about taking their time with sex and not thinking about the trauma that's going on in the world around them. And my second thought is just and like, you know, I'm just free, free flowing it. So feel free to respond to whatever you want or don't. We can move on. But <laughs> just that when you said you like you you cry after every, you know, workshop and you're kind of making light of it. But in reality, it's so fucked up that like women and queer people and trans and non-binary people are responsible for like not only um, like healing our own trauma, but typically we're also the ones who are like helping facilitate heal other people's trauma. And like cis men very rarely have a part in it. Like there are very few cis men therapists. And like if they are, then they're most likely not like trauma healers of sexual assault. Mm-hmm. And I'm angry about that. And I think it's bullshit that like that we're hurt by mostly cis men and other people, but mostly cis men. And then they're like, cool, peace. Bye. I'm not going to like participate in any of the after effects of this. And like, that's so fucked up to me. And I'm angry about that. It's infuriating. And also, like, absolutely not what I invite a cis man like I would never hire a cis male therapist sure to like support me through healing my sexual trauma right um they don't I mean as much they don't understand I mean definitely cis men are victims of sexual violence as well but at much lower scales Mm -hmm. um back to what you said about COVID I think something that we have been talking with folks a lot about is just how much like chronic stress impacts our ability to access pleasure Mm -hmm. um when we're burnt out we're stuck in lizard brain right we don't have the capacity to tap into pleasure um and it's also when we need it the most right and so it's a really confusing time because pleasure is such a key piece to like tapping into resilience and tapping into survival of dark times like this pandemic and it's like this negative feedback loop where you get stuck in this cycle of like well I'm really burned out so like pleasure doesn't really sound accessible to me and the more that we kind of deny ourselves access to that pleasure the harder it is to get to and Mm. um I think that's been like that's been a topic on a lot of folks minds lately is just gosh pleasure is hard to find 
and the energy to tap into pleasure is really hard to find. And so mm-hmm. how do we, how do we restructure our days? How do we restructure our, I mean, how do we restructure society? But that's a different soapbox. Um, how do we restructure our, our days So and our habits? Yeah, absolutely. So that at the end of a day where we do so much labor, whether that's emotional labor, physical labor, a combination of the two, whether we just open the news, like how do we save a little bit of ourselves so that we can have some piece of pleasure, whether that's sexual or non-sexual, even if it's just like taking a walk around the block or eating a delicious piece of chocolate, like it doesn't making time for pleasure is worth it and is important for our overall well-being. And I think that this has been a really, really tough season to tap into pleasure and like, yeah, it's just, it's hard right now. Totally. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, I, we have a couple questions left, but I'm curious if you can share how can listeners support a trauma survivor, either their partner or their friend or their family member, if that were to come up for folks in their community? Yeah. Uh, well, number one is definitely to believe them. Um, I wish I didn't have to say that, but I do. <laughs> First and foremost. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, like we we all know somebody we do. Um, and so like these, these tools and these tips and tricks are, are going to be helpful, even if you don't currently, or maybe you're currently not aware of somebody in your life who's experienced sexual violence, like you will become aware of it at some point, like you will have a loved one come forward. Um, and, and so, yeah, knowing, knowing these skills are going to be important. Um, so supporting a trauma survivor um, requires a lot of patience. Um, things need to be like on their terms and at a pace that feels safe and comfortable to them. Um, so like not not rushing them in any way or expecting them to share their story with you. Um, but you can, you can let them know like, Hey, I care about you. And like, I am, I am here to listen whenever you are ready to share and disclosure. We talk about this in our workshops, like disclosure can be such a powerful tool if you want to use it. And if you feel safe and comfortable doing so, and if things are on your terms, um, not if you feel pressured to share that story. So let them share their story at their own, um, at their own pace and at their own comfort level. Um, for partners specifically, it's important to know that like a survivor's strong reactions to sex and intimacy are most likely not because of you or how they feel about you. Um, they, they love you and they are just experiencing a, a trauma response. And I think it's hard to detach from that or, or um, not have that, not have that reaction um, or, or make that assumption. Um, things that you definitely want to stay clear of saying would be things that like, uh, place any blame on a survivor, like asking them what they were wearing or why they didn't fight back or why they didn't report it. Um, you know, things like, um, it could have been worse or you're a stronger person now. Um, gross um that's super Not validating I don't, have, I don't want to have to be strong about right this. exactly exactly yeah um and you also want to make sure that like you are not sharing their story with other people. Um, like that is such a huge violation of their privacy and their trust with you. And it's just simply like not your story to tell. Um, like that took so much courage and strength for them to share with you and for them to you to just like candidly go and share that with somebody else is is pretty dismissing of that experience. Um and like you're saying, we we want men in these spaces, but we also don't want men in these spaces. And it's a hard balance to find, but it's so crucial that we have men standing up against other men. Um, like when you see your friends, like 
saying something harmful or degrading or like engaging in locker room talk, like call them out on it, please call them out on it. Um, like women have been trying to do this for years and it has not gotten us anywhere. Um, they don't want to hear it from women. Um, they, they might listen if it's coming from, from their peers. Um, and if you're, interested in learning more about how to support a survivor, we do occasionally facilitate workshops on this exact topic. Um, so please give us a follow, shameless plug, um, to keep That's up. That's actually my, my last question. Oh, like, Perfect. Yeah. Tell us how people can support you and find out more about you yeah. while you're on the topic. Yeah. So we are on the internet far too often. Um, you can find us on Instagram at pleasure underscore collective. Um, you can uh, find one day we will build a website. One day we will, we had these, this like lofty intention of like having all this stuff built out. And then I pivoted to private practice and had to like get my hustle on to like make sure I could pay rent. So, sure. um, hey, in due time, Inst- every most yeah. people are on Instagram, so that's great. Yeah, so you can find us there, um, and that's where we have like links to all of like signing up for our workshops, things like that. Um, what are some titles and, of your workshops so people yeah. could know like what what they might want to join in on? Yeah, so next uh, in a couple weeks we have a healthy sexual communication workshop coming up, um, and that's great for folks who are in sitting in that space of yeah, I would love to advocate more for myself but I literally don't have the words um because most of us don't um we have a workshop series that we'll be doing over the summer which is the group setting so that's the reclaiming your pleasure workshop series um which we're very excited to be facilitating again because it's a really beautiful again like community space um we're working Anya's working on developing more curriculum around um couples so couples in which you know one or more parties is a survivor of sexual violence kind of navigating that uh we do again some like friends and family like partners of survivor programming um am i missing anything that feels crucial i feel like i'm those are our main ones yeah um but we are also like always interested in hearing from our community what they want to learn about Mm -hmm. right so if um and if we are not the right people to provide that education then we want to like crowdsource it and make that information accessible so i've been really curious lately about um sex and disability and sex and neurodivergence and so wanting to make sure that like the people who are like teaching from their own lived experience the people who are um doing that work are the ones that are centered in that so even if we don't have a workshop about it we might have someone to refer you to or we might have um plans in the works to to team up with people in our community to bring that material incredible thank you both so much hannah and anya for being on today This has been a really, really enlightening and really meaningful episode. So I'm really, really happy I got the privilege to chat with you. And thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. This was amazing. This was great. Do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and think, damn, my part is fine art? Well, Clona Willie definitely thinks so. Made in Portland, Oregon, Clona Willie makes for the most personalized sex toy on the planet. And Clona Pussy makes for the most unique memento. Their mission is to create unique, affordable, and high-quality products that will not only last over the years, but provide their customers with a fun and memorable experience. Use promo code SEXED with DB for 20% off at clonawilly.com. Want to spice up date night with your partner but not sure where to start? Check out XN's Gourmet Warming Intimate Massage Oils, created for intimate foreplay and oral pleasure. Their vegan, paraben-free, flavored warming intimate massage gels produce a gentle warming sensation when applied to intimate areas. In seven delicious flavors like strawberry, hot vanilla, mint mojito, and more, these vegan lickable body safe gels will take your intimate play to a new level. Get 25% off with code SEXED with DB at xsens-usa.com. 
Seven years ago, I was gifted my first ever vibrator. It was a Rabbit Vibe, and I was immediately in love with it and the pleasure it gave me. Having a bit of experience with Rabbit Vibes over the last seven years, I am absolutely stoked to tell you about an amazing one from Fun Factory. Miss Buy from Fun Factory is the dual vibrator you've been dreaming of, with a powerful German engineered motor that gives you super strong vibrations. Follow Fun Factory on IG at Fun Factory USA and use code SEXED with DB for 15% off your new favorite German Rabbit Vibe. Our creator, host, EP, and sound engineer is me, Danielle Bezalel, aka DB. Our co-producer and communications lead is Catherine Cohen. Our music theme is by Hook Sounds, and our ad music is by my stepdad, Bill Gant. Thank you so much to our featured guests, partners, and our listeners. Want to advertise with us? Email us at sexedwithdb at gmail.com. For more sex ed content, follow us on IG at sexedwithdbpodcast and on TikTok at sexedwithdb. See you next time.